So I'm a baby boomer. And actually, technically, I'm a, a first cohort baby boomer. And there's lots have been said about the characteristics and culture of this uh, generation. Uh, the one thing that's undeniable is that we're old. And so uh, that's what I'm going to talk about, my perspective of being around for a little while, uh, lo longer than most of the audience has been. Um, and I wanted to uh, relate some, uh, s how some disconnected uh, episodes in your life can connect to become some rather uh, interesting outcomes. So in December of 1969, I was an undergraduate studying mechanical engineering at Oregon State University. And I discovered I had won the largest national lottery in America of all time. My birth date was pulled out of a little blue capsule, the 20th pull out of a big giant glass jar at the Selective Service National Headquarters. And so when I graduated in 1972, I, among the other 95 winners with birth dates like mine, uh, was guaranteed a job in the Department of Defense. The Vietnam War was still going on. I had won that lottery, so I was guaranteed a position there. Now, so a few months later, I found myself in um, officer training school at, at the Air Force uh, training uh, camp in, um, in San Antonio, Texas. And six months later, I was in flying training at uh, uh, in Mather, California. At six months there, I had a rather nasty accident. I actually had a, a, a motorcycle accident, put me in the hospital for uh, some time. It was actually pretty devastating. My wife and I were, uh, were quite concerned because I was initially uh, paralyzed from here down. And in fact, uh, the prognosis was uh, maybe that I was never going to walk again. But I did recover. Um, and, uh, and so uh, after two months in the hospital, they were going to let me, uh, uh, they fitted me with a very exotic brace, and they said, you can go home for a month of convalescent leave, and then you can, we'll see what happens at that point. Now, just before I left the hospital, my wife came with a package, and she gave it to me and says, uh, uh, this is for you, and I opened it up, and there were plans to build a little 12-foot wooden sailboat. And she was murmuring something about, I think sailing is safer than motorcycle racing. I think you should try this. <laughs> and so indeed, I went home. I built that boat, having never built something like that before. I put it in the water. It not only floated, but it sailed. And I was hooked. Sailing had, had to be something I had to do at this point. So at any rate, um, I did recover. I got back on flying status. And, uh, but because of that accident, I actually uh, delayed getting my wings for about five months. And during that period of time, the, the Vietnam War was over. And so rather than going to combat, I actually got to spend uh, 24 very interesting years of doing some interesting Air Force things, uh, including accumulating about 4,000 hours of flying, about a million miles, uh, traveling to about 20 different countries, and, um, and, and, and leading groups of people from uh, five people to 400 people in a command or leadership role. It was uh, quite entertaining. But in 1997, I came upon a dilemma. I was here now in the Air Force at WPI, and uh, surprisingly to, me, to myself, my wife, and everybody that knew me, I'd actually been promoted to a uh, full bird colonel a couple years before that. Now that meant that uh, instead of retiring at 20 years and, and proceeding on with what we thought we wanted to do with the rest of our lives, I now had this opportunity to have vastly increased, more interesting and more uh, beneficial jobs, uh, pay-wise, uh, and, and they could expect to have about six to 10 more years of the Air Force in front of me. Uh, with ever-increasing jobs. But the dilemma was that I knew that these responsibilities would include further and further time away from my family and things I really wanted to do, I thought. And, um, and so uh, Revelation 1 came up. The Air Force has always been, by the way, about never saying no. Um, you know, it's always service over self, and I, and I kind of believe that. But my revelation was that there's a time in your life when leadership means more than directing other people. It means taking control of your own life direction. And so here we were in 1997. Um, my wife and I had fallen in love with the concept of going on a sailing venture, an exotic, romantic sailing venture, you know, move aboard a boat and live our lives on there. And so we started saving money for about 20 years prior to that and, um, and actually had quite a bit of savings for a sailboat. But then the kids came along. We had two daughters. And, um, and so we thought, says, you know, we're going to need a bigger boat and maybe a shorter trip. But from all of the readings we had, it said that, that once your kids get to be uh, 15 years or so old, then they get to that point where going with the family for a year is a burden. 
You know, you're going to lose all that social connection stuff. You're going to, your friends are going to abandon you. This is not going to be a good time in your life. And so my wife and I were thinking, we've got to do something quickly, and said, okay. We took a big breath and said, okay. And so we retired early from the Air Force. We sold, we got rid of all of our cars, all of our cars, three cars, got rid of our cars, put 18,000 pounds of household goods in storage, both quit our jobs, and bought our new home, Minerva, which was a 52-foot uh, cutter rig sailboat. Now, I got to tell you, this was a gutsy move. This was a scary move. Um, my 11-year-old, who had lived in Hawaii, uh, Alabama, England, Washington, D.C., and now had spent three quality years in Worcester, was totally um, uh, anxious and fearful and, and knew she was going to lose all of her long sought friends that she just developed here in Worcester if we were going to be gone for a protracted period. She was really, really concerned by that. Our 15-year-old daughter was, uh, was frankly a little bit anxious about being on a very small boat in the middle of an ocean, uh, let alone being away from her horse for a long time. Now, my wife was having second thoughts about this whole leaving the Air Force just when you got to enjoy the perks of being a colonel bit. And, uh, and additionally, was wondering how her proclivity to being seasick was going to pan out on this, uh, this thing. I, on the other hand, was thinking, oh my gosh, what an adventure is in store for us. I was so excited. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, I thought, how can it be better than to have your family within 52 feet from you for the next year? <laughs> what could go wrong there? At <laughs> any rate, um, uh, but I, I was having second thoughts uh, and, and actually a little buyer's remorse about this yacht. I mean, we had just spent our life savings on this yacht and frankly had just both quit jobs that were paying very, very well. In fact, I've still not made as much money as I did before I quit there. But at any rate, um, and then of course the enormity of the, of the trip was kind of daunting, but so was the size of the boat. Our previously biggest boat we'd ever owned, we could pull behind our Fiat. Now, Minerva weighed 40,000 pounds. It took six feet just to float it, and she was 70 feet tall, had an 85 horsepower diesel engine with 1,000 miles range on motoring. This was a big boat. And in fact, it had more water on board, fresh water on board, 2,000 pounds, than our entire other boat weighed. Now, and of course, the concept we were going was we had not planned on doing ocean crossings with this boat. But nobody in our family had ever been out of sight of land on a boat before. So this is a pretty significant undertaking. Uh, Revelation 2, we're not ready, nor was the boat ready for this. And so we decided we needed to, when we, we left the Air Force in 97, in June of 97, and decided we need to study. We need to educate ourselves. We need more theory and more practice before we are ready to, uh, to depart on this cruise. But at the end of five months, uh, my nephew and I had now installed all sorts of equipment. In fact, over $40,000 worth of parts we put into this boat, and we still weren't ready. But the entire family had, had determined, as we were going around and, and gathering all this knowledge on, on yachting and sailing and all this, that there are just a lot of boats tied up to docks in different places that are getting ready to go. They're just about ready to go. You know, one more year, we'll be ready to go. Um, uh, well, we're going to wait for the next weather window. We're going to be ready to go, and they never leave. There are so many boats. If you want to buy an almost ready-to-go boat, they're all over the place because no one really goes, makes that final step to leave the dock. So we decided we're not going to be that group. And so indeed, in uh, September of, uh, of 97, we weren't ready, but we decided to push off because we had to get our feet wet, and we needed to do some shakedown cruising. So, uh, you know, we went up to Nova Scotia. And we did little day trips up there and, uh, you know, overnight things and, um, and, and learned about uh, sail trim. We learned about anchoring. Uh, and through our experience of being grounded several times, learned how to read charts much better. Um, and we saw a lot of whales. It was really great. But we also noticed that all the boats that we were meeting were going south. It was now being in mid-October. And we we're still up there. And we were sitting in Bar Harbor one morning. There was frost on the deck. and said, OK, it's time to head south. The hurricane season was going to be over with. We were going to head straight down south into the Caribbean and eventually into South America, and it was time to go. So uh, at this point, we were pretty comfortable on doing day sails with our robot, our robot, our sailboat. 
but uh, it was time to, uh, to, to do the, the test of the overnight stuff. And so we planned to cruise down uh, past the, uh, through New York and New Jersey, shore, New, Jersey, New Jersey Shore nonstop and, uh, and have our first overnight um, you know, cruising experience. Everything was going well, but just outside of Atlantic City, we encountered a storm, a uh, nor'easter that was, it actually blew for about six hours on us, on our nose, uh, 30, 30 mile an hour winds, um, frigid rain, five foot seas, both my daughter and my older daughter and my wife were actively seasick, and I was contemplating it myself. <laughs> and so at 3.30 in the morning, we decided Atlantic City looks pretty good. And so we, we did a hard right and go into the nearest harbor we could find and tied to somebody's dock. We don't know whose it was. And at 3.30 in the morning, we were safe, and so uh, we decided to stay there for a little while. So that, that leads me to Revelation 3, or is it 2? One, two, three. Three. There are only two kinds of sailors, those who get seasick and those who will get seasick. <laughs> I was in that second category. Uh, but we eventually cured that problem, and we decided, OK, we're, we're ready to go now. So as we were moving on down, we, we got into Annapolis, and now it was time to do the big step. Our next step out of Chesapeake Bay was to go across to Bermuda. Now, this was a big ocean. And so at this point, we needed to really make sure the boat was ready. So we installed the life raft, the, the, the long-range radar, the, the worldwide uh, communication system, and the, the pride of my, of my uh, boat, my self-steering gear, which I had designed and, and installed myself. And so we then press on out through Chesapeake. And an hour and a half out of Chesapeake, we're out of sight of land. Now, this is really a, a nice sense. You're finally on your way. But it's a nervous sense. So I am going through the boat checking everything out because, you know, it's, it's only an hour and a half away and it's five days that way. And I discovered that my self-steering system is falling apart. The autopilot had already fallen apart. So I said, OK, this is a good thing to turn around. So we did a little U-turn, came back to Norfolk, fixed that up. You know, believe in the adage that uh, mechanical engineers always uh, talk about is, when in doubt, make it hell for stout. And so I just boosted up all the rigging like three times worth, and, and we built that up. And later on, about two weeks later, we're actually en route five days to Bermuda. Now, Bermuda trip was a trip of extremes. Crossing the Gulf Stream for the first time, it was amazing to see the water temperature go from 50 degrees to 75 degrees in a matter of minutes. Truly amazing. In fact, it was cause for celebration. We stopped the boat. We all jumped into the water. What well, we were going to was just me. No one else wanted to go into the the depths there. But we actually, I jumped into the water. It was really quite exciting. And, and then until you realize that there's nothing below you except for sharks and stuff. And, and, so, um, and so that was a highlight. Then as we come into Bermuda, we're about a day out of there. And all of a sudden, we get what's called a full storm. Now, for those of you who are sailors, understand that a full storm is what you would call a hurricane if you were a, um, a reasonable person. Uh, we had 50 knot winds and 30 foot breaking seas out in the ocean. This was not a pleasant experience. In fact, we were just two knots shy of official hurricane strength. And uh, the boat was doing fine. We were OK. And so eventually, we, we made it in at 3.30 in the morning. We made it into uh, Princess George's Harbor, uh, which is on the far side of, um, of uh, Bermuda, and uh, went to bed after uh, partaking of a little libation to celebrate the fact that we were actually anchored. Next morning, we woke up, and we discovered we were different people. We had, we had transitioned from being a coastal cruiser to a passage maker. We had survived the seas. We never looked at other lesser sailors in the same eye. You know, we'd done it, they hadn't. And so it was really quite a remarkable transformation. Even my 11-year-old had this kind of a hmm, sense of, um, of uh, you know, I've done it. And so even though she was doing, playing computer games the whole time in the storm. <laughs> so, we got there, and after having a very uh, well-deserved celebrate uh, uh, Thanksgiving dinner on board the boat, we decided it was time to head south, 10 days now, uh, down into the Caribbean. And, and, and that was the start of our eight-month odyssey down there. It was really quite a remarkable uh, uh, trip. And so we had an amazing time. And, um, and as we were coming back, um, uh, we enjoyed lots of other you know, family adventures. We did scuba, we did snorkeling, we did hang gliding off the Andes. We went to see Angel Falls in Venezuela. We did, it was a remarkable trip, a lot of bonding. But the, the, the most significant bonding fact of all was when we were 
Uh, coming back north now again to avoid the hurricane season again, so we're coming up in uh, mid-June, coming north back up through the Bahamas. And when we got to the Bahamas, my, uh, my wife and uh, older daughter, um, well, the excuse was they had to go take care of some affairs um, you know, with some family members who were, who were ill. But the real reason was they, weren't, they didn't like the idea of being seasick for another seven days. And so they jumped ship. Now, my 12-year-old and I sat there, and we thought, well, we'll recruit a crew to come with us. There's lots of people wanting to get a ride going back up to the States. And so we had a beautiful yacht. They would love this. But after taking a couple of interviews, we sat down and, and, and looked at each other and said, what do you think? Do you think we can do this ourselves? And my 12-year-old says, we got it, Dad. And so we decided that not only could we do it, but we wanted to do it by ourselves. So we set up a schedule of four-hour shifts, because it was going to be a total 1,000-mile, six-day uh, you know, uh, trip without any breaks, deep ocean. And so we set up ourselves on schedules. My daughter is a night owl, so she took the like, midnight till 4 o'clock shift or whatever it was. And, and we took off. And it was an incredible experience. It was the, the bonding that I'd always wanted. It was just remarkable. So eventually we got back up to the, to the States. And we were coming back in. And, and I, uh, uh, as we got into uh, Annapolis, my uh, older daughter rejoined us. And so there were three of us were coming back around to Narragansett, coming back into Newport. Now this was going to be exactly almost exactly one year from the time that we had first floated off. We were coming back in. And finally, we did. The next, the next morning, we reluctantly came in there and grabbed the mooring. And my older daughter was saying, you know, this has been such a fantastic adventure. I can't wait for the next one. And I got thinking about how this happened and why it happened. In the end, we had traveled about 9,000 miles under our keel. We'd been to 22 different countries. Uh, we had seen sites that, that we could only dream about and read about. We, uh, we ended up being, it was the best thing the family had ever done, in my opinion, and my daughter's opinion. My wife, hmm, see us, still seasick. Uh, but it was a remarkable bit. And I, and I think back on this, and I said, you know, could I have done this? Would this have happened had I not won the lottery? Had I not broken my back? Would I still have had this opportunity? And it made me wonder about that. And so my, in the end, my, my lessons are is that, and I can do this because I'm an old guy, is for people who are younger than me is, is understand that you have to be prepared that there will be unplanned perturbations and redirections in your life. And you can either, you know, you can either fight these or you can embrace them and see what happens next. And, and in my experience, what happens next is worth it. The other part is that I encourage my daughters and I hope that my legacy, and for all of you I wish the same thing upon you, that your life will be, will be wrapped up as being one that was fulfilling and interesting over being comfortable and conservative. Thank you.